الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد إن شاء الله we'll pick back up in the, in the book we call زاد المستكنع and just to understand the structure of Islamic books because sometimes when we say كتاب الصلاة فصل باب people don't understand what that means right in the West, we call the book, like Dad al Mustaqni'ah, we call it a book. In the Islamic structure of books, you have the bigger book, meaning with, like, for example, Zad al Mustaqni'ah is a matan, or Rawt al Murbi', which is the Sharh of Faith, or yani, Dalil al Talib, or something like this. But then within the book, you will have kutub, you will have books Kitab al Tahara, Kitab al Salah, Kitab al Zakat, Kitab al Hajj. Kitab al-Jihad, Kitab al-Nikah, so on and so on. So those are books within the book. And then the, within the books, you will have abwab. You will have bab, I mean the sub-chapter you could say, yani bab thatu tattu, bab al-witr, bab al-tarawih, bab al-sat al-jama'ah, hakada, like this. You will have then chapters. Then you have al-fasl. You will have a sub-subsection within the subsections, right? So for us, يعني, uh, in English, it's kind of difficult because we don't really uh, structure books like that. You just have a book and chapters. But, uh, I mean, the Islamic way, or the books of the Islamic terminologies, whether it is in fiqh, whether it is in hadith, whether it, they will have it like this, right? So they will have kitab, which will be a chapter within the bigger book. And then you will have bab, which literally means door. But this is a subsection and then a fasl. So we're starting a new fasl, a new subsection within the bab, which is the bab of leading the salah. Yani salah and jama'ah praying together in a congregation, which is in the kitab of salah, in the book of prayer, within the book Zad al Mustaqni'ah. I will be mentioning some points of benefit from Rawt al Murbi'ah. Rawt al Murbi'ah, the well known. Sharh, the explanation of Zad al Mustaqni'a by al Bahuti. Bahuti's Sharh is a standard. So, as I go, I will mention some of the points he mentions, and I've added some points to the matan that he added as a benefit for the brothers here. And obviously, I'm going to be referencing back to also Sharh al Mumtir of Sheikh Ibn Al Taymin. But this dars, I'm also going to go outside because uh, there are some masail we need to explain. Um, and this is a point I want to make. Uh, some of the brothers have been watching some durus online. There is two mistakes I see, and I hope for, for me, the dars is not about my dars, it's about developing you. I hope that all of you sitting here will inshallah be teaching these mutun someday, and I hope that you guys will be better than me at this. And I see brothers sitting in front of me, I see more capable, and I will see as better teachers than me, so if I can help develop that, then this is, uh, yani I've accomplished my goal. Otherwise, yani durus come and go, people come and go, there's better durus online, why are we sitting here, right? But this is for this interaction. Right? One of the mistakes I see a lot is people basically just take somebody else's lesson and mimic it. What's the point? <laughs> you might as well just you know, send a link to that other dust, right? And the other thing I see is people get a matan and they go wild with it. Like they just give their own explanation. Who are you? You're not going to figure out something new. Yani? So the job that we have today is to take that knowledge from the earlier scholars. Why are we studying Zad? Because Al-Hajjawi did an amazing job, as Shaykh Ibn Taymiyyin and others have praised, of taking a lot of knowledge and putting it in a very summarized, beneficial manner. So this is why we depend on this matan. But that matan is very tricky because he did such an amazing job of summarizing every letter, every word, the placement of words has a meaning. So if you haven't studied it, don't just pick up the book and think you can just explain it because you know Arabic. Huh? It's not the way it works. If you DJ wild style, freestyle, you're going to teach people more wrong than good. Huh? So what do we do? We go back to the works of the earlier scholars who explained this matter and sit and study this with shuyukh. 
with Tulab Ilm, with people who know the work, and then we make that palatable to the audience that we are teaching. Right? If I was teaching this matin in Saudi Arabia, which why would I be teaching it? They have better ulama and Tulab that teach it. I would not teach it the same way I'm teaching it here. And if I was teaching this in Finland, I would not teach it the way I'm teaching here. I'm trying to explain some general guidelines. When I first taught a matan in San Diego, the brothers, I know Deen was there, mashallah, shaykhana, uh, al-umda, it was very different than the way I'm teaching Zara. Why? Because my audience was not ready for an in-depth, self-focused dars. There was people who were Malikis and Shafi'is and uh, no madhab and um, hardcore maqalladeen and people who had never heard anything but the Hanafi madhab. So I discussed the other madhahib and their adilla and why we take a lot more than I'm doing in this class. Right? Because that was to focus them in so they can get away from the side tracks and focus on what they should be learning. Here, our audience now, I don't think is worried about why I take an opinion. Inshallah, I think we're past that. Right? So now we're focused more on implementing and teaching the finer details that we didn't do in an amda because of how you develop the audience. Tayyib, fal nabda inshallah, we'll begin. Yusih, the istalah here matters, the terminology. When we say something is sahih, when we say there's karaha, when we say tahreem, when we say ma huwa al-ula, al-afdal, all of this matters. Yusih means this is the, this is gonna be acceptable in the sharia. It is not makruh, it is not disliked. It is not haram, it is correct. That the iqtada al ma'moon bil imam fil masjid, that the person praying behind stands behind an imam in a masjid, wa in lam yarahu, even if he doesn't see him. And this is important. Now, these masail have some khilaf al imam, but I'm going to try to not focus too much on that, right? Because this dars is more for you to worry about your own ibadah and understanding the details of it, right? So if you're standing in a masjid, in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it was very easy. I mean, the masjid was not that big, and the people were that, not that many, so they could easily see the Prophet ﷺ. In our time, we have then these masajid, which the time of the Sahaba they had as well, which is the masajid sometimes are not enough, so we have people standing far away. So now, if you don't see the imam, is that salah acceptable or not? So the Malaf here, he, uh, Hajjawi says, it is acceptable. وَلَا مَنْ وَرَاهُ Nor do you see the one behind the imam. Even if you don't see the people standing behind the imam, إِذَا سَمِعَ takbir. The shart he puts, the condition is that you have to be able to hear the takbirat. The saying of Allahu Akbar. Yani, or here he mentioned the takbir. But we would include under that, سَمِعَ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ حَمِدَا وَرَبَّنَا وَلَكَ الْحَمْدَ Those that tell you the movements. Okay? So, for example, in the Haram, in Mecca, when we go and pray in Mecca, very rarely will you see the Imam yourself. Right? Because the Haram is packed. Right? And very rarely, even in Medina, or in many of the other masajid, in Masjid Al-Aqsa, Alhamdulillah, يعني, sometimes you can still see the Imam because the crowds are not that big. But in other big masajid, it's very difficult. And sometimes, you will be in a section, like for example, if you're praying where Safa al Marwa is, that you will be behind a wall between you and the Imam, and there will be, you will not be able to see the Imam or the people behind the Imam. So here, is that Salah acceptable or not? And there is Khilaf ulema. Some ulema thought that if there is a wall between you and the Imam, the Salah is not acceptable. Some of them said Karaha. But what is correct is as long as you can see or hear. Either one of those. If you can see the Imam and you cannot hear them, but you can see they're going to Ruku and Sujood, it's still acceptable. If you cannot see, and you cannot see those that are behind the Imam, but you can hear the Takbirat, your Salah is acceptable. But there are some conditions that will go over. Yani, this doesn't mean what we see nowadays, some people, they're sitting in their hotel rooms, and they're looking at the Haram, and they're like making Salah with the Haram. Now, you. So this is the first thing. So in this Bab, and he, as we begin the bab, I also want to give you the goals that you should accomplish at the end of And today, inshallah, we hope that we finish this puzzle today. But what do I want you to learn? So that at the end of this dars, you can go back over this and say, okay, did I learn that or did I just daydream? 
Yeah? One is the standing behind the Imam and some of the ahkam that will be about it. And second, those things which are disliked regarding this issue. About standing with the Imam or behind the Imam. And there are five things we will cover. So you should learn five things from the matan itself. In addition to that, one thing that is haram, one thing that is makruh, and one thing that is mubah that will be added to this five, these five by al that I'm going to add here. So you should, this should be the end of today. You should know these, inshallah. And if you don't, then watch the video again, so make sure you do. And I'll number them, so it should be easy, inshallah. So here we just discuss first what is permissible. The adilla, we always want to give evidences. We have Adilla, Mawquf, Rawayat that are from the Sahaba. Many of them, as mentioned in the Musanaf ibn Abi Shayba and the Sunan al Kabir of al Bayhaqi, that mentioned the Sahaba, they prayed outside the masjid and they were listening to the Takbirah. Even if we take the Marfu' yani the, 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 the Rawayat that goes to the Prophet والسلام, of the Sahabi that was going, and he made Ruku' before entering the Jama'ah. And he heard the takbirat and he made salah with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah forbid him from doing that again, meaning that you shouldn't just make raku on your way, you should come join the saf. But his salah was correct, meaning he could hear the takbirat. So based on these adillah, we say that even if you cannot say the imam, and even if you cannot see the people behind the imam, as long as your saf is connected to the imam in some way, and we'll talk about that inshallah, and you can hear the imam, then this is acceptable. In a situation where you are unable to hear the Imam himself, but you can hear the Muballigh. Who's the Muballigh? The one that's assigned to make the Takbirat behind the Imam. What happens in that case? That is also correct. Now again, that's not in the Matan here. These are from the Shuruh. This is from the explanations of the Matan. So, what does that mean? Today we have speakers, right? And we depend a lot on speakers. Today when we go for Eid Salah, or we go to a place with a big Jum'ah, if we didn't have speakers, there's no way we can hear the Imam. But the Sharia is not dependent on technology. Even though we have no problem using speakers, nothing wrong with it, but we don't depend on it. Because as we know, many a times speakers go out, right? Or there's, in other countries, you don't have electricity and so on and so on. So what does the Sharia set? It sets a method where there are people assigned behind the Imam to repeat the Takbirat. We call this the Muballiq. Hmm? What does he do? When the Imam says Allahu Akbar, what does he say? Allahu Akbar. When the Imam says Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, what does he say? Rabbana wa lakal He does not say Sami Allahu Liman Hamida. Why? Come on, man, you guys went to the earlier above. Why? Because of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he explained when the Imam says takbir, say takbir. But in that same hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us when the Imam says Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, say Rabbana wa lakal hamd. The Muballigh doesn't say Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, nor should the one praying behind the Imam. If you're praying behind the Imam, the Imam says Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, what should you say? Rabbana wa lakal hamd. Bin ala al khilaf. Al khilaf. This is a clear, sarih hadith. We say this to be rajih. So, if you cannot hear the Imam, but you can hear the Muballigh, your salah is correct. That's a lot, it's also correct. Tayyib, وَكَذَا خَارِجَ الْمَسْجِدِ So now this first was talking about, as we mentioned, that it is correct to pray for the ma'moon, to pray behind the imam, fil masjid. This was discussing inside the masjid. Even if he does not see him, nor does he see those behind him, as long as he can hear the imam. Now, if you are outside the masjid, now this is, the second scenario, right? Now you are not like in the haram, for example, all of that covered area now is inside the masjid. And the covered area of the haram is all inside the masjid. If you are outside the masjid, you are no longer inside which would be considered the masjid. Like for example, here in the parking lot. Yeah? Here as Jum'ah, we pray in the parking lot. We have no room, alhamdulillah. Yani, so here he says kada, and it is also for the one who is kharij, yani outside the masjid. Kada here connects it to yani the, the sihah of the salah. He's saying it is correct. But he says now a different condition for the one outside. He says in ra'a al-imam aw al-ma'munin. 
He goes, if they can see the Imam or the people behind the Imam. A different shaft is given. فقال البهوتي البهوتي رضو المربع he explains further he says حتى even it من شباك يعني even if it is through a window or an opening so now a condition is separated a little bit what is the separation is if you are not in the masjid you are outside then just hearing is not enough just hearing is not enough then you have to be able to either see the Imam or the people behind the Imam. So now, in this scenario, for example, you are outside, here in our parking lot. Now here we have a door that's open, you can see, and we have sufuf that are connected, we have windows, we have the other side, that's the other door that is open, so you can see those behind the Imam, so your salah outside in the parking lot is correct. But let's say if those were all shut up, and there was no window, and you were outside the masjid, and you could hear the imam, this is not enough. This is not correct. Why? Here, you have a very practical, and again, this is not in the matin, and it's not in Arud al but this is from other shuru. One of the best, I explained this, Sharah al Mumti of Shaykh ibn al Also, I, for this, I also went over the shuru of Shaykh Salih al Fawzan and others to benefit for the brothers. One of the reasoning given is because sometimes the takbir is for sujood al tilawah Now if you're inside the masjid and you can hear the qaraat of the imam and you hear that takbir, then you would usually know whether it's sujood al or not. But if you're outside and you hear the takbir and you cannot see the people behind the imam and you cannot see the imam many times unless you know <coughs> the ayat of sujood al And even if you know, Sometimes the Imam could read an ayah of Tilawah and not make sujood Tilawah because sujood Tilawah is mustahab, it's not wajib. Right? We know from the hadith of Umar ibn Khattab where he in the khutbah, yani he recited the ayah, he made sujood, the next khutbah he did the same ayah, didn't make the sujood to show the people that it's not wujuban. So what if the Imam didn't? So because of that type of confusion, now if you can see the people behind the Imam, then if the takbir is heard or not and you see them going into sujood, you can follow. Otherwise, you might be doing your own thing, not realizing what the Imam is doing. So if you are outside the masjid, then in addition to being able to hear, at minimum, you need to be able to see the Imam as well. Or the people behind the Imam. Even if it's through a window or through a doorway, as al Huti has explained. Tayyib, in addition to this, as Shaykh ibn al and others have mentioned in their shuroor, there are a imma and ulema that have put the condition that the sufuf are connected. Now here, there is some khilaf ulema. And even I was looking at some of the other madahib and they had khilaf between themselves. And I was looking at different aqwal between the, the other madahib even within their books. I'm not going to go deep into that. But the essence is there has to be some form of connectivity. Right? So here, for example, we have the parking lot. They, the sufuf in the parking lot can see the sufuf inside and they are connected. There might be some gaps. Sometimes people leave gaps and that's not good, but there might be reasons. Somebody may be sick, somebody may be sitting on a chair, somebody may have some good conditions. Those gaps within the saf do not affect the validity of the salah. The salah is still valid. Huh? But if somebody, for example, is praying in that alleyway, behind the masjid and the whole parking lot in the middle and the next half is in the masjid and there is no darura, there is no necessity bila haja, there is no uh, need for that that salah is not acceptable yeah? and this is across madahib and some of the madahib give different shurut and things like this but the essence that you should be connected to the sufuf of the masjid is there in every madhab now there there is discussion within madahib whether a wall counts or not, whether a pillar counts or not, how far of distance and this and that. Why am I emphasizing on this? Because one of the uh, strange fatawa that has come out in our times is you can sit at home, watch the TV and follow the imam on it. Even though this is not the fatawa of any of the true people of knowledge, but many people here in our city are doing this. They used COVID as the excuse for it. Look. If you cannot go to the masjid because of COVID, no problem with that. Pray your own salah. 
If you cannot go to the masjid for Jum'ah because of COVID, it's okay. Pray the whole. This is not the first time we've had like disease in the Ummah or something. We've had ta'awun, we've had plagues, we've had any infectious diseases, we've had wars, we've had earthquakes, we've had floods. It's not like we don't know how to deal with these ahkam. But new things now come up. And there are people I personally know that live in our city that were traveling, they were in other time zones and were praying Jum'ah online behind a masjid, in, I'm not going to mention the masjid, a masjid in San Diego who was broadcasting it online. It wasn't even time for Jum'ah where they were. And they were making rak'ah saying Jum'ah, listening to the khutbah online. Allah, what is this? Made a joke from the religion. No, it's not the way it works. And if you are in the haram, and you're inside your hotel room, even if your hotel is very close to the haram, and you're watching the imam on TV, you cannot make salah behind that imam. Shaykh ibn Taymin was asked this question. I have his majmu al fatawa And he was asked, can we pray behind the imam? And the shaykh, may Allah have mercy on him, as he was somebody with great sense of humor as well. He said, yes, if the TV is making ruku and sujood, then he's your imam. <laughs> Obviously the TV doesn't make ruku and sujood. So he explained, no, the TV is not an imam. I know this question has come to us of people that live in other countries that are praying taraweeh behind the imam in Mecca when it's Dhuhr time in their country. <laughs> and this seems funny, but these are real questions we get. La ikhwan, this is not the way that the sharia works. Huh? Now, if there is a partition between you and the sufuf, out of necessity. For example, we have a wall here. Yes, we have a wall. We're not going to throw down the wall every Jum'ah and then rebuild it every week. No, we have a wall. So the stuff that's outside, they can see the Imam. They can see the people behind the Imam. Physically, not on the TV. They are connected to food. From this wall onwards, we're connected. This is permissible. Okay? Out of necessity. If we could open up a big hall all the way, we would. But the mud is not big enough. I mean, regularly, we don't have people outside, but in Jum'ah and Taraweeh and so on, we do. So here, this is correct and this is permissible. But if somebody is sitting in that apartment across the street, watching the masjid on TV, they cannot make salah without Jum'ah. They can watch it, no problem. But if they make salah at home, like there's a woman or there's some sickness or some necessity, then they will make it on their own. They will make their own salah. Tayyib. Mutasih khalf al-imam alim. عنهم العالة هناك يعني فوق لكن فيها مقدار so the mullah says and it is correct if the imam is higher than them but there is a discussion I mean if you're watching this dars online don't pause it here and keep going no make sure you finish the dars before you start telling people about this because the next line we'll discuss but here we want to go line by line with evidences with adilla with proofs so the first thing is that what does the matan, what does the text tell us? It tells us that it is correct. The salah of the people praying behind an imam who is slightly higher than them is correct. And the dalil for this we can find in the hadith that Imam Bukhari and Muslim have reported. And the hadith of Sahal ibn Sa'd radiallahu anhu where he mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he ordered one of the ansar, one of the women of the ansar, that she had somebody who was a carpenter that was in her employment to build a slight uh, يعني, higher state for him and he alayhi salatu salam would make salah on it. and there's a long hadith that talks about how he made the ruku and how he made the sujood and so on but this is the base dalil that even if the imam is slightly higher than the people praying behind him the salah is correct and here we usually don't have this issue but in some of the countries you will find that the imam will be in a step a little bit higher and that is because they don't have speakers and so on so they can see the imam and the Rasul والسلام, he did this, so we find this to be acceptable. But then the Mu'allif continues, and now he will mention those things that are makru. How many did I say the Mu'allif will mention? Five. So yeah, I'm numbering them out for you to remember. وَيُكْرَهُ It is makru, it is disliked. إِذَا كَانَ If he is عُلُوًا دِرَعًا أو أَثْنَى It is makru if the height that he is higher is a dira'ah. Dira'ah originally comes from an arm span. From an arm span. But I know everybody's arm spans are different. 
right? Some of you, mashallah, have longer arms than others. So these miqdar, these amounts, have been discussed in the kutub, in the kutub of fiqh, in the books of fiqh. Huh? What is a sa'a? What is al uh, mad? What is dira'a? These things, what is qulla, qullatayn, and so on, these get discussed. And many of the imma and ulama have given very specific numbers. Especially in our recent times, I read one of them saying about 48 centimeters, right? which would be 18.9 inches. Let's, let's take it to about. Right? You don't have to start getting an inchy tape out. Right? So about, what well, I would say about 50 centimeters, around that, which would be around 19 inches. So this is about what we consider the dira in the sharia. Mm -hmm. So if the imams, the height of where he's praying is up to or less than 50 centimeters, uh, 19 inches, then that's fine. This is about the height of where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had done it. But if it is more than that, if it's a really high platform, Higher than that, then that is makruh, there is karaha. Then we give the dalil for why it's jais. What is the dalil for why it is makruh? We have a few ahadith. I will mention one of them that Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, he mentioned that he heard from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if there is an imam al rajul, al qawm, he is leading the people, he should not be higher than where they are from about that. Hadith radiyahu mentioned this hadith. This hadith is reported by Abu Dawood in his Sunan al bayhaqi in his Sunan al kabir But this is not as da'if. The Sunan is weak. And I'm letting you know because I don't want you guys to then go home and say, ha, ah, got him. <laughs> um, and because of a narrator named Abu Khalid, and he's majhul, he is unknown. But this is supported by a hadith that is also reported by Hadith radiyallahu anhu. And this hadith is reported also in the Sunan of Abu Dawood and in the Sahih of Ibn Khuzayma and Ibn Hibban and Al Baghawi in the Sharh al Sunnah and Al Bayhaqi once again in the Sunan Al Kabir. And Al Nabawi in his Khulasat Al Ahkam has graded to be Sahih, authentic. And this hadith, Hudayfa radiyanu himself, he was praying with the people above and Abu Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu, he saw him and he grabbed him bi qamisihi with his qameez, and he pulled him down. And this is the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, and their Amr bin Maruf, and Muhammad Munkar was right away, and he cleared. And after the Salah, he didn't stop his Salah, he just pulled him down. Hadayfa radiallahu continued to leave the Salah. After Salah, he told him, didn't you know that there is nahi on this? And Hadayfa radiallahu said, I remembered when you pulled me down. Yeah? And this hadith is sahih, so it supports the earlier hadith. And he sometimes, we mention a hadith, and people, they Google it, and they find some weakness. And they're like, ha, ah, gotcha. Like, it's not like that. Because you have to look at supporting evidences as well. And that's why in the end, when we come to the dust, we have all that figured out. Right? So here, Hadayfa radiallahu anhu, he's a Sahabi. And he did something. Now, this is why it's very important not to take a hadith in a silo by itself. People, they make this mistake. They take a hadith in a silo. Or they get a book of takhreej, of hadith, and they base their ahkam on it. We see this all the time nowadays. It's so annoying. Yani, Sheikh Fulan, he's a great scholar of hadith. He said this hadith is da'if. And you base your masala on a da'if hadith. Akhi, he's discussing one particular hadith. It's a book of takhreej, not a book of fiqh. So don't get so carried away. There may be other ahadith on the subject. There may be supporting rawat on the subject. It may be Hassan li ghayrihi. It may be Sa'in li ghayrihi. There may be a, a different aqwal based on the sahaba and mawqub. So calm down. Look at the, all the research on the subject before you start getting carried away. Or they take a hadith, like for example this hadith of Hadayfa radiyanu. In some of the rawat, it only mentions the Hadayfa radiyanu, let the people high up. That's huh? rawat didn't mention the fact that he got grabbed and pulled down. They say, ha! He did it, and you guys are against it, and the Sahab. Okay. Read the other rawayat, but the full rawayat on it first. And that's why it takes research into a bab before people start getting carried away. So, from this hadith, we see that a higher staff, where it would be higher than what Rasulullah did, 
was forbidden by the Sahaba. And يعني, based on the rawayat, the ulama, then they have given the miqdar of dirah, of the dirah. So, how many makruwat did we go over so far? One, <laughs> three, mashallah. Sheikh Harun is taking more ahkam out of it than I Right? What is makru? To pray on a place higher than a dirah from the people that are praying behind you. Three ahkam you can take maybe. imamatihi fi taq, and this is now an interesting uh, subject. The kaf here connects what the kiraha. What is makru? Huh? He says like his leading in a taq. What is a taq? It is a niche or a niche. Huh? Here we get into a very important issue that. We have a lot of discussion in the academic circles, but most regular people never think about this, which is the mihrab, the place for salah that is behind me. Um, what, when did this begin? And how did this begin? And what is the ruling about this mihrab? This is a very deep subject. Today, almost every masjid you go to has one. And nobody really questions it. Even if you go to masjid in Abwi, they have this, they call it the mihrab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you go to Al-Aqsa, they have many. They have the mihrab of Maryam alayhi wa which I don't know how they found because the masjid was destroyed in the time of Umar radiyanu, except that down underneath masjid, the up one was built by the Malik in Marwan. So I don't know where he got the mihrab of Maryam alayhi wa they have the mihrab of Isa alayhi salam and of Yahya alayhi salam and everybody and mashallah. And even in Al-Aqsa, if you go under the Qubba to Sakhra, they have a mihrab for Hassan and Hussein. I don't know when in Tariq Hassan and Hussein went and built those, but they have them somehow. A Suyuti wrote a whole book on this issue. And I looked up, I have the PDF of it. And I looked up the works of many other Imma and Ulema, uh, many of the Hanafi and others that wrote upon this issue. In essence, the mihrab was not known in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Masjid al-Nabawi originally did not have one. Uh, Asiyuti and others have mentioned that the first time that it was built was during the time of Walid ibn Abdul Malik. Walid ibn Abdul Malik, one of the Amawi Khulafa. We've discussed him in the Tariq, in the Sira Durus. I'm not going to go into detail about him in, as a person. But this seems like the first time that it was introduced. Now, many of the imma and ulema condemned it. Take it easy, relax. Let me finish the mas'ala before you start breaking it down. Um, the Christians and Jews used to have what they call altars, right? which they still have. But it is not like the one we have here. These would be places that would be designated to a certain priest and they would sleep in it and they would you know, stay in it and so on. And Rasulullah sallallahu forbid this. Many ahadith, he forbid this type of a structure. But the mihrab as this is here is not that. This, many of the a'imma and ulama, they praised it because when somebody comes in, this indicates the qibla for them. Right? Many times you go to a masjid and you're not from there and you walk in the masjid and you don't know where the qibla is. Right? So what do you do today? You look for the little mihrab that we have and this gives you the indication of the qibla. And in the time of Walid ibn Abdul Malik, when they were at that time, even though this is later, but they were Sahaba and Tabi'un alive still, they didn't condemn it. We don't have narration for them to condemn this. So what does it mean that you have to differentiate between different types of mihrab. One is that becomes like the altars of the Christians where a person could completely go into it and disappear from the sun, meaning that they would be completely in. And that is where we have a large number of scholars that condemn that. And one is when it is a smaller one just to indicate where the Imam would stand or where the Qibla is, like we have in our masjid. And the Imam does not actually stand in it. I mean, unless we shrink Shaykh Abdul Qadir down, he can't actually fit in there, right? It's just enough that's there. If you look at his sajada, it's all outside. This, there is no issue with. 
I mean, this, that is permissibility. Tayyib. So if the Imam stands completely inside the mihrab or taq or a niche, then there is a riwayah from Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu condemning that, and that is in the Muslim of Al Bazar. There is discussion on the authenticity and weakness of it and so on. But many imma have pointed out that because this was not known in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that to have one that is completely uh, engulfing the imam is makruh. As the mu'allif mentions here, we cannot say tahriman because none of the shurut of so on have been violated. But they would say there is karaha here. Right? Yet if the top or the mihrab is small, in the sense that it just kind of points where the Imam is or where the Qibla is, then there is no problem with this uh, as it had been done in the earlier times and nobody condemned it. Tayyip. Tayyip. The Mu'allif, he continues that it is disliked for the Imam, and we'll discuss a little bit more about the Mihrab coming up uh, later as well. It is disliked for the Imam to tata'u, to pray his nawafil, Mawdi' al maktuba In the place he made the fard salah. Okay. Now, I will mention as al Bayuti mentions, illa bihaja, which the Mu'allif mentions in the end of these things, because yani, the way of the matin is to summarize. So he will not repeat every single one and say illa bihaja, illa bihaja, because that's not how you condense. He will just say it in the end, but I will mention it here. So if there is a haja, for example, there is no room in the masjid except if the imam goes forward into a niche, then there is permissibility. Because that is bil haja. Hmm? Same thing if the imam gets up to pray his sunan and there is no place for him to pray except the place that he prayed his for, because people are already praying, then there is jawaz. But if he could move from the place that he made his for to pray his sunan, in a separate place, then that is correct. And if he still prays his sunan in the place that he prays his fard without haja, this is makru. This is dislike. Not haram. Not saying the salah is not accepted, but this is there is karaha, and this is true for everybody else as well. It is mustahab to switch places or at least speak after your fard before your nawafil. Thank you. The adilla for that. There are many, I will mention Al-Mughayra ibn Shu'ba, radiallahu anhu, he mentioned the hadith that Imam Abu Dawud has mentioned in the sunnahs, and Ibn Majah has mentioned his sunan as well, where he mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, La yusalli al-imam, the imam should not play fi maqamihi in his place, alladhi yusalla fihi al-maktuba, uh, where he prayed his maktuba, except if he moves. This riwayah from Mughayra ibn Shu'ba that Ibn Majah and Imam Abu Dawud have mentioned is also weak. There is weakness in it, as an nawi has mentioned in his Khulasatul Ahkam, is da'if. But it is supported by the rawaya from Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, who mentioned this, and this is mawqufan, yani from Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, al -imam, if the imam makes his taslim, he should not lam yata'u, he should not make his nawafil hatta until he moves tahawwal, he moves from min al maktuba from where he prayed his yani fard salawat, يفصل بينهما بالكلام either he should move الحول or بالكلام now this is this rawaya Ibn Hajar has considered it to be Hassan to be a reliable narration it is in the Musannaf Ibn Abi Shayba but uh, Ibn Hajar Asqalani in Fath al-Bari he reports it as well as to be a reliable narration now this is supported by the hadith of Mu'awiyah radiyanu as well which mentions for himself that when he would make his fard he would then move before making his nawafil. The, the, the reasoning or the hikmah behind that, that is given is for somebody not to confuse between the fard and nawafil. Yani, sometimes you see the imam praying in the place where he prayed his fard, you think he's continuing or they are connecting to separate between the fard and nawafil. So, if the imam finishes his fard, what he should do is move to another place to pray his nawafil. And if he prays his fard in the place where he prayed, he prays his nafil in the same place that he prayed his fard without any haja, 
then this is makru. This is karaha bi adilla. And the evidences we have given here from the authentic narrations. The muallif in the end of that, hold the question till the end, inshallah. Right? You can write it down to remember. Illa min haja. The muallif here then says, unless there is a necessity. Right? Because these are makruha, these are not things of tahreen. We can say if there is a necessity, then it is permissible. The muallif he continues, وَإِطْعَالْ يعني to, to elongate قُنُوتِهِ his standing بَعْضُ الصَّلَاةِ مُسْتَقْبِلَ الْكِبْرَ The fourth makruh thing we're mentioning here, we got all the other ones, we're all on the same track, this is number four, right? Is to elongate or to make long his sitting or standing facing the qibla after salah. Hmm? So here we have some tafsir. After you finish your salah, it is from the sunnah for the imam to make certain athkar facing the qibla. And then it is for the sunnah for the imam to change before making the rest of the athkar. Some of the people of bid'ah, for example in Pakistan, the Brailwiyah, what do they do? They say the athkar are done after the sunnah. So they make their fault. And then they make their sunan, then they make a loud dhikr together. And then some of the people that mix bid'ah, they make a loud dhikr together after fard and then after nawfil as well. And some other people, they make a loud dhikr and a dua together after fard. But the sunnah is not such. The hadith that is mentioned in the Sahih of Imam Muslim from Aisha radiallahu anha, فقالت, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم, the Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, if he made his salam, لم يقد, he would not move in from the miqdar ma qawl, from where he was sitting, until the amount that he would say, Allahumma anta salam, wa minka salam, tabarak ya dal jalali wal ikram. In the riwayah that is in the sunan of uh, Ibn Majah, it also mentions the astaghfar with it. So what do we get? That the, the Prophet ﷺ would not move from his place until he made the astaghfar, and Allahumma anta salam, wa minka salam, tabarak ya dal jalali wal ikram. These adhkar he made facing the qibla. And after that, especially in the riwayat from Ibn Majah, we see that he moved. How will he move? Some of the riwayat mentioned that he faced his right. And this is from the sunnah. That after the imam finishes, to turn and face his right. And the sahaba would then like to sit on the right of, of Rasulullah sallallahu So he would face them. So occasionally he would then turn to the left. Not to and he deprive the people on the left from his looking at them after salah. So if the imam looks towards the right, this is good. If occasionally he also turns to the left, this is fine. Occasionally Rasulullah would get up and change the spot altogether. And he would continue his adhkar before his sunnah. Not that he would make his sunnah before making adhkar. These adhkar are done in dubr salah at the end of salah, the fard salah. And the atul kursi and, and the ma'widatayn and qul wallahu had in a different time after fajr and maghrib and different adad and other adhkar that are well known in the books of dhikr that are done at the end of salah. So the imam should make his istighfar and his Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak ya dal jalali wal ikram still facing the qibla. And as some of the hadith mentions in a louder voice, in a slightly raised voice, not in unison, not that him and everybody do this in the same. We don't have any dalil the Rasulullah would turn around and make a dua in jama'ah, in congregation after every fard salah. Although you can make your own dua after the salah, and in the salah before taslim is mustahab, but to make a congregational dua every, at the end of every fard salah, we don't see adillah for this. Tayyib. So here we find some ahkam of how it's done. If the imam stays facing the qibla, making long adhkar and dua, even on his own, then this is, there is karaha here. Why? Because it goes against the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And there are other uh, yani, reasoning given, for example, for the people not, that they don't know what, what's the going on with the imam now. Is he continuing salah? Is he finished? For example, if the people come in and they see him facing the Qibla, sitting down, they may think he's still in Tashahud, right? And so on and so on. But the Adilla from the Sari Ahadith are enough for us to know. فَإِنْ كَانَ ثَمَّ ثَمَّ here, not ثُمَّ, but ثَمَّ, يعني there, 
نساء لبث قليلا يعني if there are women there then the mullah is saying that the men should stay there in their places for a little while for the women to be able to leave okay. um, this is the hukam first that if there are women present in the same location then it is from the sunnah that the men stay and they make their adhkar and the women leave right after their dhikr their salah and when they finish the taslim they leave right away now First, Adilda. What is the dalil for that? There is the hadith in Al Bukhari where Umm Salama radiallahu anha she said that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, if he finished the taslim, qama and nisa, the women would get up right away and leave. And he would tell the men to sit, yasiran, and to sit for a while so that the women would leave first and the men would leave after that. This is explained further with some other narrations. And Al Zuhri, Imam Al Zuhri explained this. He said that this is so the men and women don't mix on the way out. See? In another narration, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he left right after salah and he saw the men and women were going in the street outside at the same time. So from that, he ordered the men to stay and make the radhkar and told the women to leave. And he made a bab, a door which was called Bab al-Nisa, which is still there. And Abdullah ibn Umar and others, they swore never to go through that door. Even after the time when there were no women at that time. Why? Because he specified this for the women. Tayyib. Zuhri and others have explained this hadith, and so has Ibn Hajar al-Qalani and Fath and so on. But, uh, let me summarize the issue here. What is the issue? Is to prevent mixing between men and women. And this is from the calamities of our time that the masajid have left this altogether. Now masajid have made one door for everybody. So men and women come in from the same door and they mix going into the masjid and going out from the masjid. And this is against the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa It amazes me how people misuse a hadith. Some of the masajid, they don't want a barrier between men and women. They say, oh, in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa there was no barrier. Okay? Why do you have the same entrance and exit for men and women? What happened to Bab and Nisa? Why do you have men and women leave at the same time? What happened to women not coming to the masjid if they put perfume? What happened to the women coming to the masjid and going home in such hijab that they wouldn't be recognized? What happened to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that the women should walk on the sides and men in the middle so they don't even touch on the streets? What happened to a hadith like this where he would tell the sahaba to stay and make dhikr so the women would be gone so they wouldn't mix? Don't take things out of context. If you really want to go that way, then don't build roofs. Just put any palm trees on top of your masjid. <laughs> Not having a, a, a barrier at the time was due to the, the fact that they didn't have a lot. But Rasulullah sallallahu put in checks and balances to make sure that there is no mixing between men and women. And this is one of them, amongst many others. So we should always take things in consideration. If we have a place like this where the women's section is separate, then if the women want to make their adhkar, there's nothing wrong with them. They can stay in the masjid and make their adhkar because there is no issue. Here in our masjid, alhamdulillah, we have different entrances and exits for men and women to the best of our ability. Yeah? If you have a masjid where you have one musalla, if you're going to go down that path, then you have to make sure that all these checks and balances are in place. Meaning if a woman then comes to the masjid with perfume, then you as the imam are responsible to tell her sister, go home. Don't come to the masjid with perfume. Are you going to do that? If you're not, don't play with the religion. If the woman comes without proper hijab into the musalla where there are men and she is visible from that which is not allowable, whether it is the color of her clothing or whether it is the inside clothing, meaning the abaya or the jilbab is the outer clothing above your inner clothing, not that you just walk out with the same clothes you wear at home and you put a cloth on your head. That's not hijab. Go look it up. So if a sister comes like that and you have one here, if a sister comes like that and she cannot be seen, khalas, we have some flexibility. But in that masjid then, then you have to tell her sister, go home. You're not doing that. So don't play with the religion. Yeah? If then in the masjid, you tell the brother, brother, you sit, make your adhkar, sister, you leave right after salah. You're not doing that either. Then if you're going to bring in those kind of evidences, then you have to live by it. Yeah? May Allah protect us. But if you're in a situation where there are women, 
and there is the fear of the mixing of going in and out, then it is from the men that they stay and make their adhkar and the women leave right away. If that situation is not there, for example, yani there are no women in the masjid, there is only a men's musallah, or the women are in a separate section, then if the men leave right after their salah, it's permissible, and the women stay to make adhkar, there is jawaz here. Because there is a ilma, there is a reasoning which he mentions here, is that women and men not being able to mix. Tayyib, the fifth, and it is makru, yakrahu. Wukufuhum, it between sawari, which is the pillars, if it breaks the sufu. Tayyib. Now, what does that mean? If there are, if there are pillars in the masjid, and it is not necessary for you to make yourself between them. Like you make, you could make yourself away from them. Then there is makru to break the sufuf without reason. Illa bil Yani, for example, here we expanded the masjid, so there are certain places where we cannot take that out. It's to support unless you want the top floor to fall, which we don't. Right? So here there is a necessity. So even if the saf has a pillar between it, there's nothing wrong. With it. But some of the masajid, they have pillars, and the saf can be made without breaking it from the pillars, because the pillars would be where people make sujood, and they can make sujood around it, and the next saf can be in front, then that is the correct way to do it. Yeah? It is makru to break the sufuf with pillars, except out of necessity. Okay, that is the fifth of those things that are makru. Here, the matan from Zab is finished. al beauty he mentions, yani, uh, a few other things in Rawat al which I'll mention here because he mentioned it. One of them, and it is haram to build a masjid to harm another masjid close to it. Tahriman. It is haram, not makru. He mentions it to be haram. And this is the issue of Masjid Durar, the masjid that is made to harm another masjid. And unfortunately, in our time, we see this a lot. And there is a masjid. And there is no need for another masjid to be built next to it. Now again, if there is a necessity, if there is a need, then it is permissible. And this is something that should be taken to the ulama. We don't want to just be, this is masjidara, masjidara. Take it easy. We have ulama still alive. Why do you need to go and give fatah? But if there is a masjid, and there is no need in the sharia to build a masjid close to it, and somebody builds it just to harm the first masjid. What did they, uh, nobody's going to say that, right? Nobody's going to be like, we're building this to harm them. No. But there's a masjid. And then you open a masala a block away from it. Why? There, no, there could be a necessity. It could be the imam is uh, worship graves. And he could be. Or they have a grave inside. I've seen it. In other countries where they have a grave right inside the masjid. So brothers build a masjid next to it. Because they don't want to pray in a masjid where there's a grave. That is understandable. Yeah. Or the imam is an open kafir. And I know that's hard to swallow, but it's any. There are imma in different countries that will justify um, things totally khalif to the sharia, knowing better. Meaning it's not a lot of jahad, not a lot of ignorance. But they'll come out and talk about democracy being the best form of governance and so on and so on. Things like this, I mean, they're serious. And again, we're not here to make takfir. We take that issue to the ulama. And if the ulama come back and say, this person is kafir, how do you make salah behind a kafir? How many salahs are you going to repeat? Right? So there are some, but usually that's not the case. What do we have the usual case? We have tribal differences. This is for this tribe, and we're going to build a masjid next to it for another tribe. This is for this political party, we're going to build one next for a political party. We don't like this imam, we have some personal issue, we're going to build a masjid here. These things are not allowed in the Sharia. In the Sharia, we should try to unite as best we can upon the Kitab and upon the Sunnah, upon the right Aqidah. We try to unite the Ummah. So here our beauty mentions this. The next thing he mentions is, I told you one will be Mubah. He says, it is Mubah to use the Mihrab. Right? Now, in the Shuruh of Rawat al which is the Sharh of Zad al-Mustakni, they gave some Shuruh. He said that there should be a, a mihrab where the imam does not disappear in it. Meaning if it's so big that the imam can no longer be seen except right behind him. I'm not saying necessarily there's like a wall between it. 
then there is karaha, and some of the ulama took this to be tahriman. But if you have a mihrab that is small, like the one we have here, and the imam doesn't stand in it, the imam stands outside of it, then there is jawaz here. And what is it? It's really an indication of the qibla and where the imam is to stand and so on. Secondly, it shouldn't imitate the altars of the Christians and Jews. Meaning it shouldn't become a place that where, for example, the priest goes and closes a curtain and lives in it and you know, those, you know, the way the Christians and Jews and so on they did. It shouldn't be like that. Right? Rather, it should just be an indicator of the qibla and so on. There is jawad, this is mubah. And there is a lot of discussion amongst the different madahib and ulama and even between madahib and so on. But this is the essence of it. The last thing which is something that is makroh that he has mentioned that is dislike for someone who has eaten onions or it's like to come to the masjid until the smell is gone. Of course, as you know, garlic and other strong offensive smells are included in that as well. This is the end from what uh, al Bhuti mentioned in Rotul Murbeh. What do we learn from that? It is makruh, there is karaha for somebody to come to the masjid with bad smell. Onions specifically have been mentioned and garlic and so on which is strong with it. But other bad smells as well. Now, I will make a point. Sometimes somebody is a laborer. I mean, they work hard, they're working with their hands, they're working like, you know, you go to some of the Gulf countries and you see people that work in very high buildings and, I mean, they don't have time to go take showers for every salah. And they may have some I mean, bad smell, but this is not something that we can condemn them for. Why? Because they're laborers, maybe they're farmers, maybe they're working in, I mean, they're, they're doing the best they can. So some people, they're like, hey, 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 they'll get a little too girlyish on this, right? Somebody comes in and the cologne they don't like, they're like, you, out. Like, no, that's not the way it is, right? Somebody may be coming from a hard day of work, somebody's driving taxis or Ubers or so on and so on. Don't get carried away, right? But things like eating garlic or onions or you know, somebody smelling nowadays, especially smokers. I'm going to pick on smokers here, right? They go out, they light up a cigarette, they smell like cigarettes, which is something that is haram to do anyway. Makru, whatever, it's haram. Khalas, yani. Or they're vaping or whatever and they come in with that bad smell to the masjid. This is at minimum makru for sure. And this is not something out of necessity. You didn't have to eat garlic and come to the masjid. You could have done siwak, you could have brushed your teeth, you got mouthwash in this country. If you have onions, it's not like the laborer or the farmer, the poor guy that's trying to earn his risk and doesn't have the ability to go take five showers a day. Yeah. So here we need to understand the differences. One, some people get a little too carried away. And don't get carried away. Be understanding of other people's situations, especially things that are out of their control. And the other is people that are inconsiderate for the masjid. And one of the things, may Allah protect us, uh, and sometimes people have to burp, I understand. And it's a natural thing. But you don't have to burp on the person next to you. I know you're like, come on man. Like, I know you had sausages or whatever for lunch. I didn't need to know smell it, right? If you are going to burp, try to control it the best you can. I'm not condemning people for burping. It's a natural thing. It doesn't break your wudu and things. But fine, but be considerate of the smells that you bring into the masjid. And if you're bringing in things like you just ate onions and garlic or something offensive like that, and I'll include cigarette smoke into that, then there is kiraha, this is makru. Yeah? If you brush your teeth, you do siwak, and you try your best, then alhamdulillah, welcome to the masjid. And obviously you know the hadith on this and so on. So we'll end here, and we finish the fasal here. We'll continue the next one, next Wednesday, inshallah ta'ala.